Well, good afternoon and welcome to this World Affairs Council of Orange County session with Ambassador David Shin and Dr. Zainab Usman on conflicts in the Horn of Africa and implications for regional security. Uh, we're lighted, delighted to have them with us today for what I know will be a very interesting and insightful discussion. Uh, I'm Richard Downey, the chairman of the programs committee here at the World Affairs Council, and it's a pleasure to have uh, all of you with us here today. Um, we want to make this a lively discussion uh, today, and uh, we want you to be a, a part of it. So really, all you will need to do is uh, to ask a question is to go at the bottom of your screen. You can either go to the chat uh, box or the Q&A box and uh, just click on that and ask a question at any time. The, uh, at the end of the session, uh, following the conversation with, Dr. Sh uh, with Ambassador Shin and Dr. Usman, uh, we will have a period for Q&A and our vice chair of, of programs committee, Rick Putnam will host that discussion. That's when your questions will be answered. Um, I should mention that the World Affairs Council of Orange County is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we take no institutional positions on any particular issues that are in the public debate. Uh, however, we do try to present a variety of perspectives on all of these issues so that our members are uh, aware of what's, what's going on uh, regarding any particular issue. Uh, and speaking of, of members, uh, we'd like to uh, invite you, all of you, to, uh, to join the World Affairs Council of Orange County if you're not already a member. Um, we, uh, uh, as just like all organizations during the COVID period, uh, we've got hit pretty hard and uh, we would be very grateful for your membership, which will help us to put on more great programs like this one, especially as we move into in-person events uh, which will be coming here shortly. Um, now, this is also a very good time to become a member of the World Affairs Council of Orange County because we have, as you see on the screen there, uh, there's a discount of $55 off for any particular, in uh, any of the membership levels. So it's a really good time. All you need to do is use the discount code, which you saw on there, which is WACOC webinars. Use just, it's very easy to do. Just go to our website, click on the membership link, and there's a button. And then you put in that code. Again, that's WACOC webinars. And, uh, uh, and you, it, you'll get $55 off. So we would be very grateful if you did. Thank you. Um, so it is a, a real thrill to have uh, our, our speakers with us today. Our moderator today will be Dr. Zainab Usman, who is the a senior fellow and also the director of the Africa program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. Uh, she is an uh, expert in the areas of institutions, economic policy, energy policy, and emerging economies in Africa. Uh, she also has a new book coming out in November uh, entitled Diversification in Nigeria, The Politics of Building a Post-Oil Economy which uh, sounds uh, very interesting. She's also has a very wide uh, band of experience. She's worked on projects for the World Bank as well as Oxford University. And she's been involved in projects all across Africa, uh, as well as in the Pacific and in Papua New Guinea and the Balkans and Serbia and Uzbekistan. So um, her publications are, uh, are many and too, uh, too many, too numerous to, to mention here. So uh, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Usman now to introduce Ambassador Shin and start the session. Dr. Usman, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. It, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here and to be part of this discussion. Um, so now I introduce uh, Ambassador David Shin and, and without having to read his extensive profile. Um, he uh, was a Foreign Service Officer of the U.S. State Department for over three decades, including uh, very prominently assignments as um, Ambassador in Ethiopia, as well as in Burkina Faso. He's currently um, a, an adjunct professor of international affairs at uh, the George Washington University. And he received his uh, numerous degrees, including a doctorate. Uh, from the George Washington University itself. 
um, so Ambassador Shin uh, is an author of numerous books, including China and Africa, A Century of Engagement. He wrote uh, the Historical Dictionary of Ethiopia in the year 2013, uh, among other books, articles, and book chapters. And he has particular interests on uh, China-Africa relations, uh, the East Africa, uh, um, East Africa and the Horn of Africa uh, specifically, but then also um, uh, religious fundamentalism, conflict, uh, US policy in Africa. Um, so we, I, I really look forward to having this discussion and moderating this conversation. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador. Thank you, Zainab. Excellent. So I guess one question to start with is, um, what are your observations about the Horn of Africa today? And where do you think the countries in the region or the sub-region are headed? Sure. The, the Horn of Africa is, uh, in my view, one of the, the most conflicted corners of the world in the post-World War II era. Uh, there have been periods when it has been relatively peaceful, that's true, uh, but there have been too many times since the end of World War II where some or several parts of the region have been in conflict. Uh, for example, just to tick off some of the recent issues that have come up in the area, you, you had the war between Southern Sudan and Sudan that resulted ultimately in the independence of South Sudan. Uh, you then had the independence of South Sudan, but that turned into civil war for a period of time uh, in South Sudan. Uh, you had conflict between Chad and Sudan, uh, mainly in the border area, but sometimes conveying all the way to N'Djamena, the capital of, uh, of Chad. You've had serious problems in Darfur that are not yet resolved although it's not as conflictual at the moment as it was in the earlier part of this century. Uh, you have at the moment a border conflict between Sudan and Ethiopia, which is a, it's a longstanding issue, but it's one that um, has uh, recently revived itself for reasons unrelated to the, to the border itself. Uh, you have a, uh, an ongoing guerrilla war now in Tigray region of Ethiopia that broke out in November of last year and is uh, a major problem as we sit here today. Uh, you had at the very beginning of this century a, uh, a border dispute between Ethiopia and Eritrea that resulted in tens of thousands of soldiers killed on both sides. And then later you had a, a lesser border conflict between Eritrea and Djibouti. Uh, you've had a, a longstanding conflict in Somalia involving a terrorist group known as, as Al-Shabaab, which has uh, links to Al-Qaeda. And then you have a conflict between Somalia and Somaliland, which declared its independence uh, from Somalia, but has not been accepted by Somalia. Uh, you had a, a long-standing, uh, ongoing conflict between Somalia and Ethiopia. It's quiescent at the moment, uh, but there's no guarantee that will remain quiet. And then you even have a long-standing, relatively minor uh, border conflict between Egypt and Sudan uh, called the Halib Triangle, uh, which is quiet at the moment, but will likely break out again. <clears throat> the point being, you have had a lot of conflict in this part of the world. And at the moment, uh, some of it has revived and creating a lot of problems there. So it, um, it's a real challenge for both the leaders in the region and for those countries that are partners of these countries and are trying to help them develop. Um, lots of issues. Yeah, so let's, let's zoom in a bit on one of those um, countries where there are internal hotspots, but also, um, you know, several border um, issues and, and challenges. And the one I'm talking about in, in, in particular is Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia was, uh, uh, within this century, it was and still is one of Africa's rising stars. 
um, in the sense that being the continent's second most populous country with a population of um, around 110 million people, it achieved um, strong growth rates within the century, the two decades of the century. And actually between uh, the year 2010 and 2019 for about a decade, the country grew consistently at around 10% per annum. Um, and it is a country which despite everything else going on around it was able to achieve significant levels of poverty reduction. So in, in, in the year 2011, around 30% of the population lived uh, below the poverty line, whereas by 2016, this figure had declined to around um, 24%. So, you know, it, it was also a country where there was just, there just seems to be a lot going on, you know, with manufacturing and so on and so forth. But it is now in some kind of civil war, you know, with the conflict in Tigray and then actually other parts of the country as well, Oromia, Ogaden, and all of those. What really is uh, driving this resurgence in conflict in Ethiopia and the, the broader political crisis in the country? Well, you're quite, you're quite right that Ethiopia had a very good record on economic uh, uh, GDP growth in recent years. And it still is probably not bad, although uh, coronavirus has had a negative impact on it as it has had around the world. Uh, the, the problem in Ethiopia is, is really one of governance, and they haven't quite figured out how they need to move forward in terms of their system of governance. They've been operating on a system of uh, what they call ethnic federalism uh, by the, the previous government. That seemed to work okay for a period of time, but it had its own problems, and it's, uh, it's now come back to haunt them to some extent. So you've had some ethnic issues break out around the country, the most critical one being in Tigray region, which is that part of uh, Ethiopia that borders Eritrea. In other words, the, the northernmost part of, um, of Ethiopia. And that's where the fighting is going on primarily at the moment and what you're hearing about in, um, in the press. But there are other ethnic issues in Ethiopia now that you don't hear too much about, uh, mainly involving minority, ethnic minority communities in places like Beni Shango region, which borders Sudan, or in you know, Oromia, which uh, occupies a, a significant part of all of central uh, Ethiopia, uh, and, and lesser issues in other parts of the country. So it, it tends to be problem, a problem that revolves around ethnicity, and that also accounts to some extent for the, uh, the difficulties in Tigray region. The Tigrayans were in a leading uh, political position in the country prior to the, the current government that um, came into power in 2018. Uh, the Tigrayans who constitute only 6% of the population of Ethiopia were effectively uh, either pushed out or or opted out of uh, the central government and things have deteriorated ever since. So, so now you actually have a, an ongoing guerrilla war between the central government in Addis Ababa and the regional government that has a capital called Mekele uh, in Tigray region. And there is no quick end in sight for that particular conflict. In fact, for that matter, there's no end in sight for dealing with the, the the various ethnic issues that um, are challenging Ethiopia today. So, it, it, you know, in addition to what's going on inside Ethiopia, um, you already mentioned earlier, there are also issues that are resurfacing with neighbors. Uh, and one that immediately comes to mind is um, around the Gerd Dam, the Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. There are disputes there with Egypt, with uh, Sudan. Uh, and you, you know, you look at the situation there, one has to wonder that this, this really shouldn't be that intractable, but it, it is turning out to be. Uh, the African Union has been involved here and there. 
the other day I was reading that uh, um, Egypt is trying to raise the issue with the United Nations. Uh, it's really becoming, uh, it's, it's expanding beyond the immediate country's concern. Um, you know, what, what can be done about this? How can it be resolved? Let me give you a little more background on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It's a, it's a very important issue at the moment. It's resulted in a, a lot of ink spilled in the international and regional press involving Egypt, Sudan, and, um, and Ethiopia. The, the Gerd Dam, once it is done, and it's about 75, 80% completed at the moment, uh, will be the largest hydropower dam in all of Africa. Uh, it's enormous. Uh, it will be any, a huge benefit to Ethiopia in terms of solving its electricity problems, which are significant. And that's why, Egypt, why uh, Ethiopia is so uh, insistent upon going forward with the dam. Uh, the problem is uh, that the Egyptians, and to some extent the Sudanese, the downstream countries, argue that, well, if you put such a big dam up uh, on the Blue Nile River, in Ethiopia, uh, you're going to prevent water from reaching Sudan or Egypt. Uh, Egypt is 95% um, dependent for fresh water on the Nile River. And about 84% um, of all of the water reaching the Aswan Dam comes out of Ethiopia. Most of it out of the Blue Nile. There are several other tributaries that, uh, that add some of that water, but the, the majority of it, about 60% of all the water reaching the Aswan Dam comes from the Blue Nile. That is the river on which this dam is being built. Uh, Egypt is very concerned that the construction of the dam is going to uh, negatively impact their water supply. Now, they're right to the extent that when you fill the reservoir behind the dam, you're obviously holding water back. But this is a hydropower dam. And once the reservoir is filled, water continues to run through the dam. It's not stopped. It, it goes through as, as though the river were running normally. Uh, so the problem is getting agreement on how fast you fill the reservoir so that you do that in a manner that does not harm Sudan or Egypt. And then the other big issue is, uh, according to the Egyptians, that once the reservoir is filled and the water is running normally again, and the, and the reservoir is already partially filled, they, they did a fill last year during the rainy season, and you have the rainy season at the moment in Ethiopia, so they're filling right now. Uh, but once you, you fill the dam, there is the question of what happens if you have a prolonged drought in the Nile Basin region? and you have serious water shortages as you had in the, um, in the mid 1980s uh, in Egypt where the Nile ran very, very low and the, the, the high dam at Aswan uh, was uh, becoming a serious problem because it didn't have enough water behind it. Egypt is saying, well then if that happens again, then Ethiopia must release water from their reservoir to meet our needs. And the Ethiopians are saying, but this is a problem that human nature, the, the, that, uh, that the climate uh, creates, not one that we create. We don't, we don't control rainfall in the Nile Basin. So we have a problem over what happens with a prolonged drought of, of three, four, five years uh, in the Nile Basin area. But this is an issue that's being debated uh, today by Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, it's gotten all wrapped up in these other disputes, uh, in part because Sudan was supporting uh, Ethiopia's position on the, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, but because of the outbreak of the border conflict uh, between Sudan and Ethiopia, uh, it has sort of switched its alliance uh, to Egypt, and it's gotten very, very complex and very messy. So within this complex and messy situation, what role do you think um, regional institutions can play or should be playing? So here I'm referring to the African Union, you know, IGAD and any other regional entity, and there are quite a number of them across the African continent. 
What role? In, in, in the case of all of these organizations, it's important yeah. to keep in mind that all of these countries are members of those organizations. So if you're a member of EGAD, uh, EGAD is essentially the organization for East Africa and the Horn of Africa. Egypt is not a member of EGAD. Uh, but the other Sudan and, and uh, Ethiopia are. Uh, so they're obviously going to determine to some extent what those organizations can or cannot do, and they're going to operate in their own interest. Uh, in the case of the African Union, uh, all of these countries are members, so they all are acting in their own interest. The African Union is actually trying to mediate the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam issue. Ethiopia is insisting that the mediation be done by the Africa Union. Egypt is insisting that no, it needs to be broadened and taken to the United Nations or involving the European Union and the United States because they see the African Union, which has its headquarters in Addis Ababa uh, in Ethiopia as uh, perhaps being biased and, and favoring Ethiopia. So they don't like the idea the African Union leading the mediation effort. But as of the moment, that's the way it stands. And so far they have not reached uh, uh, any agreement on sorting out the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam issue. And it's not clear that there's going to be any quick resolution to it. Uh, at the same time, I don't see it moving anytime soon uh, to the United Nations for a solution. So zooming, zooming, zooming out a bit beyond um the African continent, you find that the region, um, that's the, the um, Horn of Africa, is becoming a theater of sorts for great power competition, uh, primarily between the United States and China, but also you have the involvement of other global powers or emerging powers like Turkey, the Gulf Arab countries, and so on. So in the case of Djibouti, this is a country that hosts around five military bases, uh, bases uh, by the US, by China, by France, by Italy, and by Japan. And Russia is also trying to establish one if it can. Um, so what? how do you think the countries in the Horn of Africa can skillfully navigate to this great power competition that is increasingly playing out uh, in their borders? Uh, that's a, a huge question and, and I, I won't, I'll come back to that, but let me just say one more word about a, a more regional situation that's very important in terms of understanding the interactions of the countries in the region. And that's the question of, of refugees and internally displaced persons. Uh, you have more than 4 million refugees in the Horn of Africa at the moment. Uh, you have about 1.5 million refugees that are currently living in Uganda, mainly from South Sudan. You have a map up, so you'll be able to follow along with me here. You have another 1.1 million refugees in Sudan, uh, primarily from South Sudan. Uh, from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and neighboring Chad. You have over 800,000 refugees in Ethiopia from South Sudan, uh, Somalia, and Eritrea. And then you have smaller numbers, about 50,000 refugees in Somalia from Ethiopia and across the Red Sea in Yemen. And you have another 30,000 refugees in Djibouti uh, from primarily from Yemen across the Red Sea. And then on top of that, and even more significant, is that you have about more than 10 million internally displaced persons, uh, primarily in Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan. This is a, a huge, um, it creates huge demands on the governments of all of these countries and the international organizations and, and the bilateral partners of these countries in order to care uh, for these refugees and internally displaced people. And it constitutes an enormous amount of disruption and movement both across borders and within countries. Uh, but moving on to your, your questions, Ina, on um, the great power conflict or, or competition in the region, 
that too has become very complex, uh, as you suggest, in recent years. And it's in large part focused around the importance of the Red Sea. The map that we have does not show the Red Sea connecting up with the Suez Canal, uh, but it does. And uh, if you were to go a little bit further north, you would you would see that uh, this is the major commercial shipping area that goes from the Indian Ocean uh, through the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which is the strait between Djibouti and Yemen, up the Red Sea to the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean. And for those of you who follow closely world events, you will recall that about a month ago, there was a huge uh, Japanese container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal that blocked all the traffic for um, about six days and it caused a horrific problem for all of the major Asian and European trading nations. It didn't uh, impact the United States that much because we don't receive that much commercial traffic through the Red Sea. We're more concerned about uh, military passage through the Red Sea. But for the European countries and China and India and others, this was an enormous problem. Fortunately, it was resolved in about six days and everything started moving again. But it's because of the importance of this um, commercial uh, shipping path that the, the outside players are, are particularly concerned as to what happens on both sides of the Red Sea. The, the Gulf states on the one hand, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, um, and even up further north into Jordan and, and Israel, which have outlets on the, uh, in the Gulf of Aqaba, which reach the Red Sea, and then Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, and Ethiopia on the African side. Uh, Djibouti has tended to be sort of the flashpoint for all of this in that Djibouti has allowed military bases originally from the French, who had the first base there during colonial times, followed by the United States, which has its only large military base in Africa in Djibouti. It's one of its probably the single largest military base, foreign military base in, in Africa today. Uh, then joined by um, small German contingents, Italian contingents, a small Japanese base and a fairly sizable Chinese base, all located in Djibouti today. They're interested primarily in ensuring the integrity of the shipping route because they all are, are deeply involved. The United States is primarily there in a counterterrorism capacity. Most of the activity at the American base has been dealing with the, the problem of terrorism, mainly Al Qaeda, to some extent the Islamic State in Yemen and in Somalia where those, two, those organizations continue to be important players. Uh, but this has resulted, needless to say, in um, a certain amount of competition that is going on among these different powers, uh, particularly the role of China in the area now. China initially joined the group in an effort to, to uh, support its anti-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden. As most of you will remember that piracy, Somali piracy was a serious problem in the Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia. Uh, it has basically uh, disappeared as a problem in the last five years or so. So there's, there's no particular need for large uh, naval forces in the area to combat piracy. It could always return, I suppose, but at least for the time being, it's, um, it's essentially been ended. Nevertheless, China decided that it will continue its uh, anti-piracy task force in the Gulf of Aden, and uh, it sends on a regular basis two frigates and a supply ship to the region and rotates them through on a, on a three-month basis and has every intention of continuing that. Well, it's no longer really to combat piracy. It's to stay engaged militarily in the Red Sea area. Uh, to support its peacekeeping operations, to be available in the event of evacuations, uh, as it was involved in Yemen several years ago, evacuating Chinese nationals, and to uh, extend uh, Chinese power uh, into this part of Africa. So there's a lot going on here, um, 
and it's all related to the importance of uh, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and Bab el Mandeb as a major commercial shipping area. So you mentioned you mentioned China, and uh, China has emerged you know within the last two decades um, as more or less a global power, and some would even say a superpower. Um, uh, just uh, December last year, it crossed the uh, per capita income threshold of ten thousand dollars, and it has claimed to more or less eradicate have eradicated poverty completely. Uh, from the country. I think uh, last year they had a celebration on that. Uh, but China has also emerged uh, within this time as a very important economic actor in Africa, uh, as well as in the, the, the Horn of Africa sub-region. Uh, from your experience, your work, your, you know, your, your, your scholarly writings and engagements, what do you think China is offering to the region that is different from what other external powers are doing there? Is it just financing? Is it loans? Is it debt? What, what is going on there with China in Africa? Well, you're absolutely right in that China is an economic superpower. There's no question about that. Uh, I would argue it's not yet a, a military superpower, certainly not uh, anywhere near to the extent that the United States is. But it's growing, and it's uh, it certainly intends to become a military superpower, uh, and Africa is part of that. It's not a critical part, but it is nevertheless part of it. What China has done in not only this part of Africa, the Horn of Africa, but throughout the continent, is to provide um, huge amounts of financing for infrastructure projects, uh, roads, railroads, uh, hydropower dams, uh, this Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that. Uh, was referring to earlier, uh, China's building the transmission lines for that dam. Uh, an Italian company is actually building the dam, not China, uh, but China is very much involved in it. Uh, ports, uh, China's building ports all around Africa, and it's taking an equity investment in some of the ports. So in the case of, of uh, ports around Africa, China's um, strategy is a little different. It's not just a question of of uh, making a loan, uh, getting repaid, and having a Chinese company build the railway or the dam for profit, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of both that and having an equity investment in the port, which suggests to me at some point it wants to use the port for something else later on, at least some of them. Uh, and I think that is part of, of China's objective. Uh, China is Africa's largest trading partner. Uh, it passed the United States in 2009 um, and has retained that title. But interestingly, China-Africa trade peaked in 2015 and it uh, then declined significantly and it has never returned to the 2015 peak. And for that matter, Chinese financing of infrastructure projects uh, in Africa peaked in 2015 or 2016 and that too has not returned to the peak levels. Uh, so a lot of what China is doing in, um, in Africa actually reached its peak several years ago and then either declined or flatlined. Foreign direct investment in Africa has pretty much flatlined. It, it hasn't diminished, but it hasn't been going up in the last several years. A part of that is due to developments in China, part of it's due to developments in Africa, and of course, in the past year and a half, coronavirus has had an impact on that. Uh, but we're starting to see some, uh, a little bit of a slowdown in some of China's activities uh, in, throughout all of Africa and in the Horn of Africa. Uh, the, the Horn of Africa and Northeast Africa is a critical part of China's uh, vaunted Belt and Road Initiative. You've probably heard a lot about Maritime Silk Road goes through the Red Sea, for example. Uh, but it's a little unclear what all the Belt and Road really means for Africa that's any different than before the Belt and Road was announced in, um, in 2013. Uh, to me, it's almost an extension of China's foreign policy of doing pretty much the same thing. I don't see that much difference going on. So, so before, before I move on, I, I just wanted to kind of um, uh, you know, ask a follow-up question on, on China's 
world in Africa, and of course, in that sub-region. Um, you mentioned that Chinese financial flows to the continent peaked from around the year 2015. And there seems to be some kind of uh, perhaps rebalancing going on. So what do you think uh, is likely to characterize future Chinese engagement on the African continent? Or do you think, or would you say that there's just going to be a complete retrenchment of engagement? No, that's a, a fair question. And I don't think there will be a complete retrenchment. Uh, I think you're, you're basically seeing um, a period where China is doing some reassessing, uh, where it was happening at about the same time that COVID-19 broke out, which has had an impact on everybody around the world. Uh, it's, it's caused, uh, there, there, are some, there are changes going on in China's domestic economy. It's, it's being reconfigured to some extent, becoming somewhat more of a consumer economy, perhaps a little less based on, on exporting. Uh, I think that's had an impact uh, globally, uh, including in, in Africa. Uh, and I think in the, in the case of loans to Africa, their debt has been building up in too many countries in Africa. In, including several in the Horn of Africa, like Ethiopia and, and your country, Nigeria, where there are growing concerns about, um, about debt. And I think China understands that. And they too want to be judicious and not be throwing money at countries that are going to be hard pressed to, uh, to pay back loans. So there's been a, a retrenchment on the loan side and that may continue for some period of time in the case of those African countries that are going to be hard pressed to pay back loans. Some countries are not. Some African countries are still doing fine economically and it's not, not particularly an issue. Uh, but with a, a number of them, the uh, International Monetary Fund has identified six African countries that are in debt distress and 15 African countries that are at high risk of debt distress. Now, not all of those countries have, a, have borrowed a lot of money from China. Some of them have no money from China. They, they borrowed it from other sources, uh, from Europe, from the International uh, Bank, you know, IMF, et cetera, uh, private banks in, in Europe. So China certainly is not responsible for all of that. But China is, um, is taking another look and I think concluding that now, this is a time to maybe slow down a little bit, to back off, see how things work out. Uh, China's not pulling out of Africa by any means. They will, they're definitely there for the long term. Uh, but it may take a few more years before they get back to their peak periods of 2015. So now, now let's talk about the other superpower, the country in which we're both located, uh, the United States. Um, what what do you think characterizes uh, U.S. relations with the Horn of Africa, but also with the African continent more broadly? But also another question on this front is, um, what do you think the U.S. can do differently from what it has done in the past, which is really, for many people, they would say, uh, to an extent, the U.S. has not uh, shown as much interest in many parts of Africa as it has shown in other, to other parts of the world. So what else can be done differently? So two questions. One is, what is it that characterizes US relations with the Horn of Africa and body with the African continent? And what can be done differently? The United States clearly drew back to some extent from Africa after the end of the Cold War. Uh, the competition with the Soviet Union and its allies drove an awful lot of American activity in Africa until, um, the very early 1990s, at which point there was a certain pulling back. And that uh, continued to be, an even, in my view, an even greater problem during the, the, the four years of the Trump administration when the, the interest diminished even more. Uh, we have a new administration now, and it remains to be seen uh, whether the Biden administration will try to revive or even increase above the activity of say the Obama administration or the Bush or Clinton administration's uh, interest in Africa. There are some indications that it intends to do that. 
um, and that the focus is going to be on things like emphasizing, as we have done in the past, uh, support for democracy in Africa, uh, a concern about human rights abuses, uh, which we didn't see too much of during the Trump administration, and engaging the private sector, leveraging the private sector of the United States to invest in Africa and support African development. And I think those are all going to be themes of the Biden administration. These are not new themes. They're, they're simply reviving old themes. But I think you're going to see them pushed much, much harder uh, than we have seen in the, la in the previous four years. Uh, so I, I'm not suggesting that, that the Biden administration is going to do anything that's really new. Uh, but I think it will show greater engagement in both the Horn of Africa, which has already happened. You've we have a, the Biden administration has a special envoy for the Horn of Africa now, who's very much engaged in, in trying to help um, uh, end the, the political disputes that I've alluded to. Uh, but I, I, I think there will be more and more engagement. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I, I hope that there's also more, uh, more American resources, either private sector or governmental, uh, that can go into Africa. And that remains to be seen. Uh, so, so let me follow up on that and then we'll conclude. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that the Biden administration uh, may engage a bit more with Africa compared to, let's say, the, his predecessor, uh, Donald Trump, but it may not necessarily be by doing things too differently. And if that is the case, um, you know, one, one has to wonder, is that enough? Is that sufficient, given that there are other partners for African countries? And, um, you know, the, cont the continent is, uh, at least the population is growing very, very fast. By mid-century, uh, it's going to have, you know, the largest concentration of young people. Uh, other parts of the world, or some other parts of the world, see the African continent as a future uh, growth area, as a market for goods, you know, as a commercial and an economic partner. So is it just enough to say there'll be greater engagement, but by doing more of the same, as opposed to thinking about new ways of engaging with the continent? Uh, again, a fair question. And the, the short answer is no, it, it probably is not enough. Uh, certainly not by the United States alone. And that's why I think the Biden administration very recently adopted at the G7 meeting, the Build Back Better uh, project, bringing all of the G7 countries uh, into this effort to, to work with infrastructure development in Africa, and then also invite other, uh, other countries outside the G7, like India and Australia, uh, South Korea, uh, so that it will strengthen the effort. And even that may not be enough. Uh, but having said that, I, one point I should have uh, emphasized earlier is that the, the one thing the United States has always done in Africa, including during the Trump administration, was we're always the first with the most when it comes to humanitarian aid, uh, particularly emergency food aid. But the US has always been very, very good and very fast at providing humanitarian aid. And you can be assured that will continue uh, in the Biden administration and perhaps will be expanded uh, during the Biden administration. Um, so I, th I think you are going to see an increase in activity, but um, it's premature to say whether it's, it's going to be significant increase in activity or a modest increase in activity. It will be more than what you saw during the Trump administration. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the issue of uh, young leaders in Africa. One of the, uh, of the uh, initiatives that I'm sure the Biden administration will revive is the Obama policy of interacting with African young leaders. That was a major initiative under Obama, and I'm sure it's going to come back in the Biden administration. Okay, I'm mindful of time. So my final question to you before we um, hand over to our hosts is, um, what is your outlook for the Horn of Africa, but also the African continent more broadly? Where do you see things headed? Well, that's a huge question. Uh, it's almost impossible to talk about um, the African continent in one breath. 
There are 54 countries in Africa, and they're going in every which direction at the same time. Uh, some are doing very well, some are doing very poorly, and a lot of them are just sort of muddling through. Um, and I, I suppose that if I had to make a continent-wide prediction, I, I would simply extrapolate from that. There will be some that are going to do very well and some that will continue to do very poorly and, and probably a majority will, will kind of muddle through and, and not do um, poorly, but not do brilliantly either. As far as the Horn of Africa is concerned, uh, at the moment, quite frankly, I'm a little more pessimistic um, in that Ethiopia is such a critical country for success in the Horn of Africa that if things go poorly there, they're likely to go poorly in many of the neighboring states. And until Ethiopia can get its act together and end this conflict in Tigray and deal with the other ethnic problems that it has, uh, it's going to be hard for Ethiopia to get back on track economically. And it just has to do that. Uh, if Ethiopia can get back on track and particularly uh, have a, uh, a uh, cordial arrangement with Eritrea, where it until recently did not have a cordial arrangement, uh, things could actually improve very quickly. But I, unfortunately, I don't see that happening anytime in the next several months. It seems to be getting more difficult in Tigray region rather than an improvement. Any, any, um, anything in the region that gives you optimism? In addition, I know there are a lot of problems there, but is there any, so we can conclude on a positive note? Well, I, I'm watching the, uh, the governance issue in uh, Sudan very carefully, uh, although there's some serious challenges to making that work. Uh, so far, it's certainly a big improvement over, over the, uh, the al-Bashir government. So that's, that's a, a potential positive. The, uh, the situation in South Sudan is very fragile, uh, but at least there is not significant fighting going on. Uh, I'm not sure that's a real strong positive argument, but it's better than, than a lot of fighting going on. Um, as I say, I'm a little concerned about Ethiopia at the moment. Uh, things are pretty stable in, in Djibouti and there are elections coming up in Somalia which will be important if they work out well. And if there is some sort of um, outcome to the elections that make the government more stable there, but you still have the ongoing Al-Shabaab threat that is very worrisome. So it's, it's a little challenging to be too optimistic about the Horn of Africa at the moment. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna now hand over to uh, hosts. Thank you, Dr. Usman, for, uh, for leading a, a great discussion. And thank you, Ambassador. I'm just gonna take us through the audience Q&A here. Uh, we've got some great questions and I'll, I'll try to be as um, you know, straightforward with the question as possible. Um, and the first, just getting back to the US policy in, uh, in the Horn of Africa uh, is, would, would moving US AFRICOM uh, out of Germany and Stuttgart to the African continent and perhaps to the Horn of Africa, help build regional partnership or in uh, and, and the US uh, assistance to reducing conflict and increasing security there. Uh, US AFRICOM being the, the US command for, for African, US military command for Africa. Uh, in my view, that would be a big mistake for two reasons. One, we already have a, a large military facility uh, in the Horn of Africa. The, in fact, the only big facility we have is in Djibouti. So putting AFRICOM in there um, to me would, would not really help any, in any way. Uh, also, I think moving AFRICOM and all of its infrastructure anywhere in Africa is a mistake. Now, there are those in the US government who disagree with me on this, uh, but in my view, uh, frankly, I would just as soon see it located on the East Coast of the United States rather than in Stuttgart. I can't make a real strong argument for Stuttgart except for the fact that we have a facility there and it's, it's easy to organize and, and operate and they're in the same time zones. Uh, but other than that, uh, I, would, I could make an argument for putting it on the East Coast of the US. I think putting it in Africa is, uh, anywhere in Africa is dangerous because there is no guarantee that 10 years from now, whatever country you put it in, is still gonna want it there. 
uh, and new governments may come into power and say, get rid of this organization uh, in 24 hours. And that's not exactly what you want to have confronting it. Fair, fair enough. Uh, give us an update on how the, how the US is reacting to the situation in Tigray and, and what should the Biden administration be, be doing to react to that unfortunate conflict? Yeah, I would argue that the Biden administration has been quite forward leaning on Tigray. There are those that I have argued with, including on CNN last night, that think it has not been forward leaning, but uh, the Biden administration has been very outspoken in uh, supporting uh, the, the human rights concerns uh, and the human rights uh, issues, dealing with the human rights issues that are going on in, uh, in Tigray region, everything from the problem of uh, rape of women, which has been pretty well documented, uh, to the uh, withholding of food from persons who are in need of food, uh, to the difficulty of um, some of the uh, non-governmental organizations and international organizations getting food to people who need the food. It's also been outspoken in terms of urging Eritrean troops to leave Tigray region. Uh, and it's had numerous meetings at high levels with the Ethiopian government on these issues. Uh, it's imposed some very modest sanctions against Ethiopia, but uh, it's been, I think, quite outspoken and, and very active. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure there's a great deal more realistically that one can do, uh, certainly if other international players are not going to join in. And countries like Russia and China have said they want nothing to do uh, with any kind of um, action against the government of Ethiopia. Thank you. Uh, just sticking with policy for a moment, um, what advice might you have for the energy ministers gathering in South Africa soon for the African Energy Summit and what effect or impacts for the Horn of Africa might that have? I'm not sure I can add much in terms of the Horn of Africa, uh, particularly, although there is a huge gas project in, uh, in Ethiopia that in the Ogaden region that the Chinese are developing and there would be a pipeline going into Djibouti. And I think it would be good if that could go forward. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the status is of the pipeline at the moment or how much progress has been made on it. But supporting those kinds of projects is a positive thing. Uh, there is oil that is under development um, in Uganda, uh, which also the Chinese are involved in. Uh, the United Kingdom is also involved in it. Uh, more generally, though, if you look at Africa as a whole, I guess one of the things I would like to see the energy uh, ministers in Africa do is to try to pull back from the use of coal. Uh, now, South Africa is one of the major coal producers um, in Africa, so they're not going to like that suggestion at all. But uh, for, for purposes of, of helping to preserve the climate, uh, I think the Africans would be well advised to um, look more towards cleaner energy. And then they are working with solar and, uh, and to a lesser extent, wind energy uh, in Africa. But I would like to see a lot more focus on, on renewables in Africa. And I would like to see the energy min ministers push that. Uh, they tend not to focus that much on the environmental consequences of what they're doing. I think that's a mistake. Uh, thank you. Um, I know we've spent a little bit of time on, on China, but there is a, another question here. Um, and maybe if we can drill down a little bit on the, you know, the Belt and Road impact to, to, to the Horn of Africa. And the question is, to what extent have these countries there conceded their, you know, their treasuries, you know, their, their national treasuries to China? Um, maybe just a little more detail on, on the various ports or infrastructure projects and and the, the amount of money involved. Yeah, this, um, you almost have to take this country by country in Africa because there's enormous variation. The one country that is deeply indebted to China is Djibouti. <clears throat> the estimate is that the percent of Djibouti's debt held by China, uh, the estimates range between about 55% and 85%. Take your pick. Uh, but in any event, it's a lot. Uh, in the case of Ethiopia, it's probably closer to 35%. And then in a country like Somalia, it's zero. 
uh, Somalia owes nothing to China. So it, it's all over the map uh, in not only the Horn of Africa, but uh, throughout the continent. And there are quite a number of countries in Africa that, that have little or no debt with China. So it's unfair in my view to be uh, excessively critical of China and the amount of debt that it holds, uh, African debt that it holds. If you take the entire African continent and the entire African external debt, uh, China holds about, according to the best estimates, 20% of it on average. Uh, but that, as I say, varies from zero in Somalia uh, to somewhere between 55 and 85% in Djibouti and then everything in between. Uh, so by and large, it's, it's not fair to say that uh, African treasuries are beholden uh, to, to Chinese banks. Um, in a few cases, they are, but very few. Uh, it is true that China is the largest bilateral lender to Africa. No other country lends as much to Africa as China does. But on the other hand, uh, if, if China holds 20% of the debt, 80% comes from somewhere else. Where is the 80%? Well, it's the World Bank. It's the African Development Bank. Uh, it's private European banks and bondholders. Uh, and it's a handful of other bilateral countries. Thank you. Um, let's turn a moment to sort of uh, population and demographics. And it was mentioned um, in uh, Dr. Osman's questioning earlier, uh, but how does the African continent's overwhelmingly youthful demographic help hinder or simply complicate their conflict trajectories um, in the Horn of Africa, or perhaps uh, on a positive note, uh, you know, future prospects economically? Yeah, you know, the the uh, the demographic issue has you know it's a good news bad news component. Uh, the good news with uh, demography in Africa is that it's the youngest population, regional large regional population in the world, and that's I would argue good news. Uh, it's also the fastest growing population in the world, and you can make an argument that's good news too, uh, in that you want to have a lot of young people coming along to, um, uh, to, work, to do your labor, to do your work, and to create, um, uh, to create an economy. The bad news is that if you don't have jobs for these people, you've got a lot of unhappy people coming along uh, who are probably going to be out on the streets uh, protesting or something. So somehow or other, the African countries have to figure out how to create enough jobs to occupy all of these young people who want to move into them. Uh, so there's a lot of potential here, but the Africans um, need to do a little better job of managing how they employ or how they deal with all of these young people coming along. And in population, population growth is sometimes a concern. One question um, Im implies that it's perhaps time to recognize that overpopulating or too many people is a, is a fundamental problem, or is that not the case? Again, it's very hard to generalize across Africa. There, there probably are some locations, um, not even necessarily an entire country, but certain parts of a country that, that the, the growth rate is, is so fast that it is causing local problems. Uh, there are other parts of Africa where I don't see it as a problem at all. Um, I, I'm not a demographer, so I, I'm a little reluctant to get into the weeds on that. Um, but I, I think that the, it's, it's a mixed bag, in other words. Thank you. Well, that, that concludes pretty much our, our Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Ambassador and, and, and Doctor. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our chair, Nora, Nora Valenzuela, for close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and Rick. And, uh, Thank you to our distinguished um, speaker, Ambassador Shin, and also Director Osman. Um, I'm very pleased that you had an opportunity of uh, sharing your time with us. I certainly learned a lot. I have to say I, I have a very strong interest in the area, but I learned more in this one hour that I have learned in a long, long time. The detail that you pay attention to is not something that the media or other entities may be able to um, share with us. So thank you so much for sharing your uh, wisdom with us. Um, it is heartbreaking to see the challenges that um, 
the continent is facing, but I am hoping that through the world collaboration and also um, just humanity as a whole, we can come together and find solution for the common problems of our humanity. And I was also very pleased to hear that the United States continues um, to be a leader in a hum humanitarian aids. I think that's um, truly a, an excellent example of our spirit regardless of our political position or partisan position in the area. So I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the World Affairs Council, I also wish to thank you. We had guests from uh, many parts of US that uh, watch your program today. And the link will be going on our website and it will also be shared with other councils. Um, from time to time, we get questions that come to us in the future that has to do with the topic that was discussed today. And with your permission, we will have our program manager forward those questions to us. Sometimes they're just too wonderful to be ignored. So um, we will share them with you. And then perhaps in a written way, we will get back to our constituents and our members. With that, I wish to thank all of our members, trustees, and our guests nationwide who joined us today for the event. I hope you find it as educational as I did, and we wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Hope as we move to our in-person events, Dr. Usman and um, Ambassador, that we will have the honor of having you come and join us in Southern California so we can share with your California hospitality. With that, I will say goodbye to you. If you wish to share anything with us before we um, say goodbye to our audience. Thank you very much, Nora. And, and uh, you may very well see me uh, out in, in the Orange County. My son lives in San Diego, so it's uh, oh. not, not far away. Uh, but I wish uh, the World Affairs uh, Council of Orange County all the best in the future with its programming. Thank you, sir. And madam? Yeah, uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I look forward to interacting with all of you and meeting you all very soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you to my colleagues, Rick and Richard, our staff and interns for implementing a very um, excellent program today. Wish you all a safe afternoon. Good day. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.